All right. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2. If you brought something to follow along with today, hold it up for us. Phone, tablet, Bible. Good. Very good. Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at this whole chapter today. We're going to be looking at this whole chapter today. I'm going to tell you a story. I've been on, on two mission trips in my life, uh, and they were, um, they were quite, um, uh, in terms of short-term mission trips, they were long ones. I was uh, in each place for a month. Um, they were not, you know, go down for four or five days and come back. Um, it, I was in the Philippines for a month, and I was also in India for a month. Um, and uh, actually, going on those mission trips... Um, is what gave me the courage to tell Kristen, okay, we can have kids now. Um, basically, I told, I, basically, Kristen wanted kids from day one. And I was always, you know, no, we're not ready. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can be a good dad. Still don't know if I can be a good dad, okay? Uh, but I was always scared. And I remember thinking, if I can go to a completely different country in a completely different culture, and speak to people who, complete, who, who speak completely different languages and study the Bible with them and be away from my, my wife. And, and, and if, I, if I can do that, then, then I can do anything because being in a far country is scary. It's scary. There were a couple moments uh, when I was on these mission trips that I, um, uh, there were a couple moments where I said, I really want to be at home right now. Uh, one of them was in the Philippines. We were staying at these people's house, and um, the, uh, the mattress, you know, normally you stay in hotels, okay, so, you know, because Americans were soft and weak, and we can't stay in hard conditions, and so we stay in hotels, uh, but uh, we were staying at this, this family's house. They were very kind. They opened their home to us, um, and the mattress was basically just like plywood, and I'm I just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm big and gross, and I don't just sleep on plywood, okay? I mean, it just is, like the last time we went camping, I couldn't sleep on the ground, so I slept in the truck while everybody else slept in the tent, okay? That's, that's me, all right? I just, I, I can't. I'm, 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 I'm a wimp. I'm a weakling. But I remember sleeping on this, on this plywood bed, and, uh, of course, you know, there's no central air. It's, it's like 80 degrees in the house. There's no flowing air. There's no fan. There's nothing moving. I mean, you're just, you're just hot and sweaty. And I remember being just very close to being able to go drift off to sleep. And some sort of animal or beast or I don't know what it was. It was, it was either a monkey or a bird. I don't know. I, I still don't, I don't know exactly what it was. But as I was, you know, you know that feeling? You know, you're like, your eyes are getting heavy and you're starting to drift off to sleep. And as I was about to drift off to sleep, this, this thing starts screaming right through the window that, I was, that, that was there. Okay? I don't know if it was a bird or a monkey. It was one of those two. That's what it sounded like. But I, you know, you're trying to drift off to sleep and you hear, bah! Okay? and you hear it over and over again for hours. And I just remember thinking, it's hot, I'm sweaty, this bed hurts, this animal is freaking out outside the window. I want to go home. I'm in a far country, and I want to go home. Now, most of my experiences with mission trips were wonderful. I mean, I, we met wonderful people. We taught the gospel to a lot of people. We had a great time. The people are very dedicated to the Lord. I mean, I just, it was awesome. It was a, an awesome, those were awesome experiences. I grew a lot. But there were those moments where I knew I'm in a far country. I'm away from home, and I want to be home. I want to be in my bed, and I want to, to be beside my wife, and I want to have air conditioning, at that, and, and I want to not have animals screaming in my ear. And it's moments like that that make you think about that scenario spiritually. I hope you'll look at Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. Because of the fall of man, of man, because of mankind, of humankind's rebellion against God, we end up in a far country. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. You were dead 
in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom all we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We find ourselves in a far country. Like the prodigal son who took his inheritance and wasted it, left home and wasted it, and ended up eating with the pigs. One day we realize that we are in a, a far country. We are far from ideal. We are far from an ideal lifestyle. We are far from God. We are far from comfort. All of us at some point wake up and realize, I'm in a, I'm, 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 I, need, I need to go home. I'm in a far country. We have been discussing foundational things. We've discussed that if you're going to build a home that is going to withstand the wind and the waves and the, the rain and the storms of life, if you're going to have a life that withstands those things, you have to build on the rock. And Jesus said, to do that, you have to do these sayings of mine, which means you've got to start with the right plans. And so we've got to start with God's Word. If we're going to build a life that withstands life, we've got to start with God's Word. We discussed last week uh, that uh, once we know that we start with God's Word, we'll realize that we have to build our life on Christ the cornerstone. There is no other. There is, is no other name under heaven by which man can be saved. Christ is our cornerstone. We may try to find other cornerstones to, uh, to replace Christ. We may try to find other things to build our lives on, but those will all come crumbling down. They will not withstand the weight of life. It has to start with Christ. And so today, I want us to talk about becoming citizens, saints, in the household of God. Citizens, saints, and the household of God. How do, we, how do we build this house? How do we build this structure? How do we build a life for ourselves that with, can withstand the wind and the waves and the struggles of life? How do we do that? Well, when we realize that we're in the far country and that we're listening to someone that we ought not listen to. We're living a life that is dead in trespasses and sins. We're people who are sons of disobedience. We're living and fulfilling the passions of our flesh and carrying out the desires of our body and doing whatever it is that we want to and realizing that that harms us and that harms others. When we're in that far country and we realize it, we have the desire to come home. So how does God bring us home? How does God bring us home? And I want you to continue with me, Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 4. How does God bring us home? How do we get home from this far country, from this life that is lived outside of Christ, outside of that safety? Look at verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Amen? Amen. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show us the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work so that one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. How does God bring us home? Well, He looks out and sees a dead person that doesn't want to be dead anymore. 
I remember when I realized that I was a dead person. I was a thief. I was a little thief and a pretty innocent thief, but still I was a thief and I realized it. Stole from a gas station. I realized that I needed to make a change. I can't be someone that steals from gas stations. If I keep doing that, that wouldn't be good. God looks on someone who is a dead person but no longer wants to be a dead person and so he makes them alive in Christ Jesus. He he makes them alive together with Christ Jesus and he does this by his grace. Not only does he make us alive, but he raises us up. He raises us up, he, he picks us up and he dusts us off. And not only does he make us alive and, and pick us up and dust us off, a sort of like the, the Good Samaritan, the man that fell by the wayside of the Good Samaritan picked him up. Not only does he pick us up and dust us off and, and make us alive, bring us back. But then, notice verse 6, he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God didn't just give us a second chance. He didn't just say, okay, get up, try again. No, He saw us as a dead person and He brought us and lifted us up and brought us into His home, into His household. He brought us into his family and gave us a treasured seat at his table. And gave us access to the immeasurable riches of his grace. That's what God did to bring us home. So he's brought us from a dead person to someone who has access to his immeasurable riches of his grace. That is a a work, a labor of love. That is a beautiful thing. And that's why in verse 10, Paul says, we are his workmanship, his masterpiece. He brought a dead person back to life, brought him home, cleaned him up, paid his debts, adopted him to his family, and has given him an inheritance in that family given him access to the immeasurable riches of his grace. That's masterpiece. And that's what each one of us are when we come to Christ. When we're in the far country and we come home because God has brought us home. So, this morning, I want us to ask the question, how do we accept the family name? Christ has paid for our sins. He has paid the price. He has redeemed us. He has bought us uh, away from that person, that prince of the power of the air who rules the sons of disobedience. He has bought us away from that spirit, from Satan, with the price of his blood. He has ransomed us and brought us home. How do we accept the family name? How do we truly become adopted into the family and become citizens, saints, part of the household of God? How do we do that? How do we make this house built on Christ our house? How do we become part of that family and accept that family name? I want us to continue on with verse 11. Verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 2. I hope that you have a phone or a Bible or something to follow along here. Verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 2. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Okay? If we're not Jews, then, then, then we weren't God's chosen people. Okay? At one time, we weren't God's chosen people, but how do we become part of the family of God? Let's keep reading. 
But now, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, who you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and, and peace to those who were near. And through, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. If you remember the beginning of this chapter, we were following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience. We were following one spirit when we were in the far country. But I want you to notice here. Through him, we, have, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We become because of what Christ has done, citizens, saints, part of the household of God. The key to understanding this is that phrase, access in one spirit to the Father. Access in one spirit to the Father. This is the same spirit who in the beginning hovered over the chaos of creation and by the word of God organized it into something beautiful and good. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. This is the same Spirit who was the breath of life breathed into Adam. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. The Hebrew word for breath is ruach. That's the same word for Spirit. He breathed into Him the breath of God, the Spirit of God. This is the same Spirit who was promised that Jesus would baptize with. Mark chapter 1, verse 8. This is the same Spirit who was poured out on all flesh at Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verses 17 through 21. This is the Spirit that makes us born again and gives us a new name. John chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. This is the Spirit into which we are baptized in order to become part of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. This is the Spirit that molds and shapes us to be more like Jesus every day if we do not resist Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. How do we accept the family name? We allow ourselves to be immersed in God's Spirit. To be immersed in that Spirit that's been poured out on all flesh. So that we can have a spiritual birth, a new birth, into the household of God and be given a new name. That is how we are adopted into the family to become citizens and saints and part of the household of God. Finally, this is the spirit that will give life to our resurrected bodies in the new heavens and new earth. Romans chapter 8 verse 11. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. So, how do we go from being someone who is following God's enemy, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit at work in the sons of disobedience? How do we go from being someone who is following God's enemy to someone who is a citizen of God's kingdom? Not just a citizen of God's kingdom, but an esteemed person in God's kingdom, a saint, someone who's set apart. And furthermore, not just a citizen and not just an esteemed person, but a family member of God's own house. Here's a few things. Number one, recognize our deadly situation in the far country. Many of us have been redeemed by Christ. Many of us have left the far country many, many years ago, but there may be some here who are there. You're far from God. You're distant from God. You don't know Him. 
Life is a struggle. It's difficult. You need help. You don't know where you are. Recognize our deadly situation in the far country. Number two, understand that God gives new life. Adoption into his family. An esteemed seat in his house. And access to all the riches and inheritance of a true-born child. To all those who in faith turn from God's enemy and toward Christ. And know that this is possible because Christ has paid the ransom price, His life and blood for all who have been taken by His enemy into the far country. He has paid the price. The ransom has been paid. Y'all ever watch the kidnap movies? You know, someone gets kidnapped, they get taken away, and they say, we, ha- we want a ransom. And, uh, you know, someone who's very cheeky says, uh, we don't negotiate with terrorists, right? You know, that's usually how that happens. Christ paid our ransom. He didn't just pay it. He also defeated our enemy, the person who took us off into the far country. Number four, make the faithful decision to be baptized into God's Spirit, being born again with a new name as God's child, to be baptized into Christ. And with your new identity in Christ, having access to the riches of God's grace, love, kindness, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, do the good works prepared for you as a masterpiece of the work of God. That's it. Citizens, saints, household of God. And I'm not saying if we do this that our lives will be all peachy and that we'll just, you know, every one of us will become a millionaire and uh, that we'll all have, you know, abs um, and thick head of hair. It's not what's promised. But what's promised is that we will have a shelter underneath the wings of God that will help us to withstand the wind and the rain and the floods and the struggles of this life. I know you got those struggles. I know that there is something in your life right now that is just has you under its thumb. Don't be in the far country when life has you under its thumb. When the wind and the rain and the waves and the floods are beating on your house. Because if you're in the far country, if you've built your house on sand, if you're like the foolish man, it's going to come tumbling down. And it won't be good. Don't be in the far country. Come home and be with God. Be a citizen, a saint, a member of his household. He has done much for you. He has brought you from death. He has given the ability to come from death to life. To come into his house and to sit at his table and to share in his riches and to take his name. I hope you'll do it today. I hope you'll do it today. We'd love to talk with you. We'd love to study with you. We'd love to help you in any way that we can. We're going to sing uh, here what we call an invitation song. This is a song that should invite you to uh, come and talk with us about whatever it is that you need. Maybe you have a prayer request. Maybe you'd like to learn about becoming part of the household of God. Maybe you'd like to set up a study at a later date. Maybe you just need a hug from a little old lady. We got that too. Okay? Little old ladies give good hugs, don't they? I don't know what it is that you need, but this is an invitation for us to help you to be your family. We've come to the table. Remember? We've come to the table and we've shared the body and blood of Jesus, the thing that we truly do have in common no matter what. We've come to the family table and we can help you with whatever you need. We talk about our problems at the table. We talk about our day at the table. We talk about solutions at the table. This is a time for you. 
If you need something, you can come sit on one of these front pews. Come go talk to one of our uh, shepherds in the back. Talk to me privately. Send me an email, f- you know, phone call, whatever it is that you need. Won't you come as we stand and as we sing?